Salve a tutti. Oggi abbiamo Good evening, everyone. Tonight we have with us uh, Vera uh, Sharaf, the founder of the Human uh, Alliance uh, Resources Protection. And uh, we, we are very pleased to have you with us. Good evening. Thank you. Buonasera, Vera. Ciao. Eh, Vera Sharav è un'attivista medica e fondatrice della Alliance for Human Research Protection e si batte da sempre contro le pratiche aggressive, le pratiche unilaterali dell'industria biomedica. Uh, Vera, would you like to um, introduce us a little bit about your practice and your fight against the uh, biomedical practices? E di questo tuo impegno contro le pratiche biomediche. Yeah, um... Experiments in human beings um, are used by pharmaceutical companies and by all kinds of industries. And usually it's very vulnerable people who are exploited. And so what we focus on at the Alliance has been really the violations of the Nuremberg Code which was laid down after the doctor's trial at Nuremberg for the Nazi atrocities that were done to human beings. And of course, the foremost principle of the Nuremberg Code is voluntary informed consent by the human subjects is absolutely essential. Unfortunately, it is not being complied with uh, as it should be. So it's been a full-time uh, job just to uh, check on experiments primarily in the United States, but it wasn't only the United States. Uh, Pfizer, for example, was found guilty of violation uh, for experiments on children. Uh, this was, and they were, they were actually brought to court in the United States on the basis of the Nuremberg Code. This was in 1997, I think. So this has been uh, a, an area where, for example, prisoners have been used in experiments. And the mentally ill have been used in experiments and the elderly have been used in experiments and the experiments range all kinds of experiments cancer environmental protection where they actually have uh, put exhaust pipes you know the exhaust fumes from trucks had elderly breathe uh, because they wanted to prove that regulations that had been set against uh, pollution, air pollution, uh, was being violated. But just think about the idea of being able to take people who, elderly people particularly, who are at risk of emphysema and all kinds of respiratory diseases and exposing them on purpose uh, to see if they would get sick. This has been done by the U.S. government. I know that pharmaceutical industry grew greatly in Italy in recent decades, so I'm sure you have your set of people who've been used as guinea pigs. As you can imagine, this is not a very lucrative um, <laughs> you know, we do it really for nothing. This is, we're all volunteers. Um, but now we are at such a critical point, we're actually at the most critical juncture in history. We are really, truly on the brink of a totalitarian dictatorship. And Italy had a taste of that in the 40s. But now the entire global population, all of humanity, is now in the crosshairs. 
So if we don't reverse this trajectory, this o- obedience, following government directives without question, that's what's gotten us to this point. It's obedience. And what will happen was, if they win this war against humanity, either we will all be annihilated or we will revert to become slaves. Those are the two choices. Nothing in between. Democracy is absolutely what they want to destroy. And for the past two years, they've been doing it. I mean, we have been subjected to the very psychological weapons that the Nazis used to maintain a state of anxiety, fear and anxiety, to, to get people to, be, to stop thinking to stop making their own decisions, to stop say no to masks, to isolation. These are terrible, terrible things. They don't appear to be, but they are very bad psychological weapons. Human beings are meant to interact with human beings. Children need to see expressions The little ones have been deprived of forming language because they don't see the lips, how you form words. And of course, they have destroyed local businesses. Uh, This is a transfer of wealth from the little people to the Amazons, the big tech companies. What does it mean to, to have, ed, to eliminate classroom education for children and have virtual, as we're doing, Zoom? This all helps to get people used to relying on technology rather than on people. This destroys human communities. People have been trained to distrust other people. Now, the, you know, some of the horrific scenes that we have seen with policemen in black uniforms, that's exactly how the Nazis were. And they are Attacking demonstrators in European cities, yes, in Italy, in in France, in Austria, in Australia, in Ottawa, and yes, in Israel as well. That is, scenes like that are very painful reminders of the Nazis. And... I want to stress that these kind of scenes, this is about the prelude to the Holocaust. Because, you know, Auschwitz didn't begin with Auschwitz. It took years. It was stages, stages of discrimination, of demonization. Now suddenly I am again a pariah. My status is now again as a pariah, this time because I'm unvaccinated. Since when do we allow government to dictate what goes into our bodies? If we allow them, if we obey, we are slaves. This is really, this is a war against humanity. And people can really, don't take my word for it. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. This is a conspiracy. The thing is, though, it's not hidden. It's all written. You can read it on the World Economic Forum. You can read it on the Rockefeller Foundation website. It's all laid out. 
Ecco, Vera, ti ringrazio per questa tua... Thank you for this um, long and thorough answer, which already includes a lot of the questions that I have for you. And one is very important, because it's a big topic, also in Italy. So, you go very much against the mainstream um, medias of information, and a lot of people that, like you, are Holocaust survivors. Um, there is, it's, it's very interesting, this, um, this parallel that you stress about the Holocaust and what's happening today, the prelude of the Holocaust and what's happening today, and what happened to you was, of course, uh, horrible, and it, 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 it's really important, I think, that people that come from that reality know that freedom and democracy impose a, a, a debate, a scientific debate, for instance, in what's happening, for instance, with the, with the vaccines today, and and differently from a lot of the things that we've been hearing till today, you do see a similarity between what happened to you and what is happening today with the absence of this debate on the scientific matter and so on the vaccines in specifically. The scientific issues get debated and should be debated by scientists. We can read what the different scientists say. Science is not something static. So when, they, when the government tells you we're going by the science, there is no the science. Science keeps changing. Science is about debate. Science is about finding new answers to old problems and to current problems. And there's always a give and take. In the end, maybe there's a consensus, but guess what? Ten years later, there's new information. And it changes again. It's in flux. It is not static. Government public health officials try to tell us as if there is one answer and one answer, and we tell you what that answer is. No. Just as scientists debate in a democracy, people are, should be debating. They should be talking to each other, not shutting people down, not censoring what we may or may not read or hear. The whole purpose of democracy is to allow, allow a freedom and exchange of different points of view Talk is something, you know, this is how we communicate. What they have done is close everything, close the borders of information as well as the physical borders in <laughs> travel. They have tried and to a great degree, unfortunately, have succeeded in isolating everybody, isolating people in their own little islands. That's very contrary to how human beings interact, how we live, how we thrive. This is a, a dictatorial way. Now, part of the issue here is what the real virus is. The real virus is eugenics. Eugenics is a hierarchical authoritarian ideology. It was crafted by and it appeals to the elites of society. Eugenics appeals to the intellectual elite and far more important, it appeals to the corporate or oligarchs and their selected government officials. At this point, we don't have real officials in government who represent us. No. We now have officials who were chosen by the oligarchs and placed in those positions. 
So that's why they listened to the oligarchs and closed down the local stores and the schools and don't listen to us. Now, what's interesting about eugenics is that the British were the ones who provided the theoretical foundation. And that has been used to justify social and economic inequality, to legalize discrimination and apartheid, as well as violence against dissenters. Now, the goal of eugenics, and this is what we have to keep in mind because that's what's driving the whole COVID narrative, it's eugenics. The goal is to eliminate people whom the elite regards as inferior genetic material. It was the American robber barons who provided the financial, political, and practical means that set in motion public policies and population control legislation. Population control leads to genocide. It was not invented by the Nazis. It was just actualized in a, in a large format by the Nazis. I'd like to just quote Edwin Black, who wrote several very important books. The one I'm going to quote from is called War on the Weak. And what he says, eugenics was conceived at the onset of the 20th century and implemented by America's wealthiest, most powerful and most learned men against the nation's most vulnerable and helpless. That's what it's about. The American Titans use their influence to enact laws that discriminated against people they wanted to eliminate. It swept aside moral principles and stripped segments of the population of their civil rights and their human rights. And that was exported to Nazi Germany. So, Vera, uh, just uh, sorry uh, to interrupt. So, to this extent... Fa parte, secondo il tuo pensiero, il fatto che uh, durante questo periodo di COVID, so do you think that during this COVID uh, time, during these times of COVID, that, um, that the sanitary personnel was actually um, taken away of their power to actually treat the people with drugs and medicines that we actually know already and that there was a deliberate choice of only rely on one specific medicine, the vaccine, that needs to be the one solution for all. This, this premise already to us seems to be quite flawed since every system is different and so uh, not every person responds the same way to the treatments and so it seems to be illogical already. And do you think that this was a strategy, because we saw that this happened the same way in the whole westernized world, and it seemed to be a sort of like a decided, ordained plan. And us, as citizens, we're not scientists, but we do understand that it seems to be an activity quite controversial. What do you think about that? Absolutely. Now, I, I want to really talk about that uh, because, yes, uh, medicines like ivermectin and all kinds of antivirals were shown to work. And they were outlawed. Doctors were outlawed from prescribing therapeutic medicines to people with COVID. Uh, now, first of all, what also happened 
before the vaccine was launched under warp speed, in March of 2020, March and April, governments across Western Europe, five states in the United States, Canada, Australia, ordered hospitals not to treat the elderly. They were to be sent to nursing homes that were, of course, not, they're not medical, they weren't prepared, nor could they protect either the other residents or the staff because they didn't have any equipment. This was a premeditated murder, medical murder order. It so happens that it followed the exact playbill, the exact method that the Nazis used, not against Jews. The first victims of medical murder were German. They were German babies and young children under the age of three. Their crime was that they weren't perfect. They were disabled in some way. So they were taken away from their parents, taken to hospitals, and medically murdered. The doctors signed the death certificate stating that they died of natural causes. The next were children of all ages, disabled children, and then the mentally ill, and then the nursing home residents. They were all medically, some 300,000 Germans were medically murdered, a thousand children. They used, this was called T4. That was the project, T4, Aktion T4. The excuse was uh, they wanted to cleanse the genetic pool. See, that's eugenics, cleanse the genetic pool, as well as get rid of the economic burden. This is exactly what happened in 2020 in the wealthiest countries of the world. So the vaccine, which isn't really a vaccine, because we now know after more than a year that it does not. Sorry about that that these injections do not provide immunity, they don't prevent infection, they don't prevent death, and they don't prevent transmission of infection. That's the definition of vaccines, but they don't meet that definition. Now, getting back to your question about the availability of existing therapeutic medicines, but not being allowed to use them. Well, you see, The United States law says that if there are treatments available, you cannot bring, you cannot market a vaccine or a new drug as an experimental drug. You can only treat people with experimental drug if there is no other available. So they declared nothing available when it was available. And the scientists kept, there are by now maybe a hundred articles for hydroxychloroquine, for ivermectin. They tried to uh, demonize doctors who prescribed these drugs to save lives. And of course, these drugs are used in the underdeveloped countries, in Africa and the Far East. And guess what? They don't have a big COVID problem. What is more evidence than real life evidence? Of course. Um, Thank you, Vera. And 
I see that this this topic is really it's really sensitive to you. That I see that it, it it's it's really something that uh, you take quite at heart, especially for the experiences that you went through, uh, experiences that most of us only uh, heard of, and that you know we we strive to also humanly and empathetically understand. So I I wonder if I if you have a suggestion, what people can do and what, what we can do in order to go back to a system of treatments that is not in service of the financial and economic interests of big corporations and it is actually effective and transparent um, because also one of the big issues with this is that economically this is this puts common people most of the people in burden so just to synthesize um you make a clear parallel with what happened uh before in the prelude of the nazis uh regime and maybe in some people there is this actual desire longing for uh, elimination of the what is conceived as not normal uh, and instead of letting nature doing that, we want to substitute ourselves to nature and put in place atrocities uh, and horrible threats to other human people uh, in order to mm, make this happen, to this eugenetic practice to actually happen. So what is that people can do in order to make sure that there is at least an effort to try and avoid the repetition of this? I have to stress something. Uh, there is a very strong concerted effort to prevent people from speaking the way I speak. And you have to ask yourself again, why? Why are people absolutely pilloried if they touch the Holocaust with current history? There's a reason for that, because if many other people examine the history and they will then recognize the parallels that I see, because I only see what's there, I'm not making it up, then they lose, you see, because then people won't obey. But if people are kept ignorant about history, and they are constantly bombarded with propaganda. Propaganda means lies. Propaganda is manufactured information according to whoever pays for it. It has nothing to do with truth. It tries to bury the truth. And this is what all of us in the Western world have been living under. The entire internet, other than alternatives, such as Radio Radio, are reading from the same script. If you switch channels, you'll hear the same words, just different faces reading the same words. This is not news that we are getting. We have to stop following the government corporate ordered truth, because that is going to bury us. The only way we can save ourselves, our families, and our community, and really humanity at this point, is we have to stop obeying. We have to resist. This is the time. Now, I have to, I'm going to be very straightforward, as you can probably already see. I'm very straightforward. At the end of World War II, we were rescued. Whoever, whoever was left was rescued by military armed forces of the United States, United Kingdom, and at that time, the Soviet Union. This time, there will be no rescuers, no one. No one will rescue whoever survives. So it behooves us, every one of us, while we, while we can, while we still can scream and walk and talk, we must do that. 
I think that anyone who has spoken to Germans will know what happened when the grandchildren asked the grandparents, where were you? What did you do during that Nazi terror? Only the Aryans were supposed to be left standing, ruling. He was going to eliminate the Polish people, the Slavic people, the Italian people. He had big plans and he was stopped. And we have to stop this cabal now. So, so do you agree that one of the, the ways that could help would be enhancing the debate and enhancing the debate of public information. Like we need the we need to reestablish the possibility to have to avoid censorship and to allow the debate to include different and discordant opinions. Because a lot of the things that you're saying are not actually possible to be found on mainstream medias. And so so is the answer in trying to reestablish one of the most important and fundamental pillars of democracy the possibility to access many and different informations and without censorship censorship and by everyone look just as you and i find credible sources of information even with all the censorship by avoiding those that censor, by avoiding the mainstream entirely. That's what people need to do. They need to do their own homework. They need to not be lazy and just go click, click, quick. No, it's not quick. It takes hours. Yes, but it's there, it's available. And I think it behooves adults to be the guardians of their children, not to entrust Fauci or whoever you have as an equivalent to dictate to families what they should be doing for their children. No, you need to go and find those sources. There, they doc there are thousands and thousands of doctors and scientists who are speaking out, who are writing, who are imploring people not to take the shot. They are giving you reason, and now you have reason from the adverse event database. You have the Euro, and we have the VAERS in the United States, Vaccine Adverse Event Database. The, the, the evidence of harm of children getting heart attacks, I mean, when has that ever happened? Only vaccinated children are getting heart attacks. Now, how long will people want to remain ignorant, willfully ignorant? I say no. Yes, there's censorship. Yes, but that means you need to write off, don't watch CNN, don't watch the major media, go and find the other ones. And you quickly do get to yourself, judge, which one is really nonsense and which one is real. You will find treasure troves of information which you can use to protect yourself and to arm yourself with knowledge. So, Vera, we need to have a personal and individual awareness of judging the source of information by, by not just avoiding everything, but listening to the all different point of views in a pluralistic model that allows you to then evaluate on your own, what do you deem right or wrong without leaving this power of decision to someone else, like the power, like the governmental powers. And so, yes, yeah, so, so do I understand correctly, this is your, your point? 
Yes, absolutely. And I want I want to tell you a, a small vignette from my time as a child. Uh, in 1944, this was the height of the final solution. And they were going to eliminate everyone who was left in the concentration camps and send them to the death camps. And my mother got wind of a rescue operation for orphan. So she lied and put me on that uh, rescue mission. My father had died already in the camp. So for 10 months, I was sort of a child in transit. Uh, I was sent back along with the other children to Romania. We were rescued, uh, it, really it was bartered. Somebody, some organizations paid money, ransom called that. But the point is, there I was, I was very little, I was six and a half by then. Uh, and I needed to assess people. I needed to find people who would help me because I knew I could not do things for myself. I was not capable. I learned to assess people by the way, you know, again, the facial expression, kindness. Uh, I, and I was helped. During that time, I was helped. I was helped, for example, by a Christian family, Christian Romanian family. They took me into their home and nursed me back to health. I learned to do that, okay? Now, on the train, this is at the end of about 10 months, on the train to the harbor city, uh, where we were en route actually to Israel. At that time, it was not the state yet. I befriended a family on the train. And when we got to the city of Constanza, there were three small boats. And they started to read the names. Each one of us was assigned to a given boat. I was assigned to the boat with all the orphan children. I refused. I absolutely refused to get on the boat with the children, no matter what. Everybody boarded. I was all alone, all alone, sitting there on a little valise, crying, crying. I was not going on that boat, no matter what. I was not going on that boat. I wanted to go with the family. I trusted that the family would take care of me. I did not feel comfortable with a whole bunch of children, the bullying. I was little. This was, I, no matter what, you couldn't, they couldn't convince me. In the end, they gave in, which is a miracle by itself. I was very seasick. So the first night, though, I fell asleep. While I was asleep, a submarine torpedoed the boat with all the children. There were no survivors. The next morning, that's when I learned about it, because everybody was still so upset. I didn't say a word, not one word, but I thought, hmm, I was right. But I had a pang of guilt. I felt guilty that I was glad to be alive. That's, you see, that's, now, here, I wasn't, I was very, very upset that the children went, but, but I stood up for what I absolutely, my instinct told me, don't go on that boat. Now, you know, someone can say, well, it could have been the other way around. It could have been the boat that I was on that was torpedoed. Yeah, but it wasn't. The point is, when you 
make decisions about your life, you are responsible for that decision, and that's fine. That's what adults are supposed to do. But if you defer to authority, whether it's government or doctor, it doesn't matter. If you defer to authority, they will not be held accountable for what happens to you if you're maimed or if you die. Not at all. They always walk away like it was nothing because it doesn't affect them. Decisions that affect you, you should make the decisions. That's what God gave us free will. Everything they're doing is godless. And I mean godless in the most basic way. They, ha they do not recognize hu the humanity of humans. They don't recognize feelings. They don't recognize love. They don't recognize anything that's human, that makes us human. Our frailties and our strengths. No, they want to make us into automatic puppets, robots. And they do, in fact, intend to create transhumans, partly <laughs> technology and partly biology. Well, I don't want to live in a world like that. And yes, I am very sensitive to the signals, to the patterns, because of what I went through as a child. So it's both from my memories but also I've studied a great deal. And unfortunately, in the 20th, 21st century, for some reason, they really stopped teaching history for the lessons that can be learned so that we don't repeat them. It's history was sort of, oh, that one, that's, that's a long time ago. You know, I, I know that Americans, I mean, if something happened more than two years ago, it's, it's unimportant. Well, it's the other way around. It's the other way around. And I think, you know, Europeans have a longer history. And history teaches you a lot. And you have a rich history. Italians have a, you know, very rich history. Ecco, <laughs> Vera. That's what I like about Italians, you know, they usually... <laughs> Grazie. Yes, ecco, vera. Italians are, are emotional. That's good. Yeah, that's vera. true. That's true. Vera, We can vera, definitely vera, say vera. that. Um, vera, ecco, vera. Noi I ti really thank you because th there's so much uh, that we're getting from your will to share and the power that are coming from your memories and from from the things that you're that you're bringing up and maybe it's also because we're Italian and we are very emotional but thank you really much um, I have two things to to say uh, before the last few questions and again I I can't stress enough how how glad I am that you're a part of our um, of our program Uh, my first question is, a, a child that goes through all the atrocities, like the ones that you went through, grows earlier and maybe acquires a lot of awareness before the time. And so, is, do you think that this sensitivity uh, that you have to certain topics is given for you and the people that went through the same things as you because of what happened to you, because of your experience, of your history? And my second question is, What do you think about the fact that authority today is preventing us from, from taking your decisions freely and that this deferral of a free will, it's almost imposed to us and it's done with a scheme and a structure and a slogan, a motto, we do it to defend commun secure, communal security, but Can communal security be more important than individuality and than freedom of individual choice? Freedom of individual choice, that is exactly what I said, God-given. We don't get our freedom from government. It's the other way around. Government 
exists and gets elected to serve the people. The people are the ones that make the choices. Now everything is upside down. Yes, that's, that's the way dictatorships work. Um, as far as my sensitivity, I will say this. One of the things that um, when I am sensitive to this as an adult, but, you know, for a long time, uh, all I wanted was to be like everybody else. Because, you know, no, nobody wants to constantly remember starvation. Nobody wants to remember being surrounded all the time by fear. Every adult, everybody around you, fear. Fear of being put on a list that goes to the death camps. You must remember there were more than 42,000 concentration camps and ghettos all over Europe. Uh, so one of the things that definitely one wanted to forget, you know, to be like everybody else. I mean, I, I, I remember as a teenager and that, I, it bothered me that I have no family heirlooms. Well, of course not. <laughs> the family was uprooted, you know, thrown out and herded into a concentration camp without anything. But those are sort of things. Now, but as I grew older, you know, and I started to see things that others seem to not see, that's when I realized, oh, I've got a whole bag that I, you know, I need to sort of take it out every so often and and see if it makes sense what I'm sort of intuiting is happening. And so, of course, by studying history, by reading a lot, uh, I learned a lot more. One of the things that I didn't know until I really read about it was that what distinguished the Holocaust from all other genocides until now was the complicity of the medical establishment. The medical establishment allowed Hitler, gave Hitler the uh, veneer of legitimacy to medical murder, to genocide, to all the things that he did. And the other, IBM provided the technology it was very clumsy technology, but it was sufficiently efficient to carry out every step of the final solution. They provided Hitler with the method of identifying every Jew in Europe. They hired thousands of people to do census, first in Germany and then in all the occupied countries. And then they were able to identify, to round up, to deport, to remove their property, to take away the um, passports. And the IBM machines were in the death camps, the slave camps, to track people. Now, IBM is still one of the major technological surveillance companies. Their green passport, the Excelsior, is the one that New York State contracted. So you see, these parallels are just so specific. And these, this is the reason that all kinds of organizations and, and powerful people want to prevent people from comparing then and now. This is one of the reasons that I am invited by so many, you know, people like you, because 
they can't quite shut me down. And I want you to really, really appreciate the fact that it is precisely the individual person and the unpredictability of the individual person. This is what will bring them down. If we have more people saying no, that means they are asserting their individuality to say no. Why go like sheep? Look, this is something that used to be asked about why did all the Jews go like sheep to the gas chambers? But you see, this is what it is. It's this fear and not being able to do anything. But on the other hand, actually, in those cases where there were rebellions, like the Warsaw Ghetto, people eh, eh, survive. Eh, eh, Ti ringraziamo per, per questa I tua testimonianza, per quello che dici. I want to thank you. It's ecco, extraordinary to hear those, um, those, those witnesses from you. Um, I know that your dad um, died in Ukraine um, as a consequence of uh, being deported, and he he was ill because of the hygiene, uh, the very low hygiene uh, conditions of the place where he was detained. And uh, today we know that Ukraine is uh, going through the, the, this, this horrible situation and I just wanted to know what's your take on it. Uh, what do you feel about what's going on in Ukraine right now? You see now, <clears throat> because I don't trust the major media, I don't know what to believe. This is a problem. We really don't know who did what and when. Uh, we will eventually, because I'm sure that some of the independent uh, media and some of the people on the ground will be able, even with the cell phones as, as is done today. But right now, I, I suspend my understanding of it, I don't know, because we have seen, and it was an Italian um, journalist who found fake, fake films from games and from old wars that are being shown now by the news media. Well, once you have that, I'm sorry. I'm, as I say, I don't know, and I'm not going to venture a guess. Sure, this, you know, Russia is more powerful and all that, but on the other hand, I have to wonder about those biological uh, research centers in Ukraine that, 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 that are run by Americans. What's that about? Those things are illegal. It's, this is what, <laughs> how we, got to get this coronavirus. It was laboratory made. That, that one was done in Wuhan. Maybe another one is being planned in Ukraine. I don't know. But the very fact that they have those is very, very, you know, it, it should give people pause. I know that everyone wants to see, oh, Russia, Russia, Russia. Okay, Russia is no angel. Actually, the Soviet Union killed more than Hitler. Their gulags had more millions. But they didn't do it with medicine. They didn't do it with all the <laughs> hoopla that Hitler it was all hidden. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, I do know that a war would be distraction from the thousands that the injections are killing. We've never had so many injury, serious injuries and deaths associated with a vaccine since they've been documenting the numbers, at least the, the reported numbers. But we can see from all over the world, Israel, they're on their fourth Now, two boosters, huh? two, right? That's two. And of course, Albert Burla said, oh, we may need boosters every six months. Of course, it's a, it, it is a cash cow that never ends. It's like money from heaven, mana. 
Why would he give it up? If the government's <laughs> paying, why not? Hey, that's great. This is such a financial bonanza. Uh, and the question is, is it also actually a bioweapon? That's what some scientists are saying. Morticians, people who um, look after the dead and, and examine their organs and all that. They're finding horrific things in people who've been injected. This is science. You know, they don't know yet exactly what it is, but it shouldn't be in a human body. It doesn't belong in a human body. It was put in. So there are still a lot of secrets. We don't know the in full ingredients of what's in the injections. That's all military secret. The, these contracts that Trump did at the time were under total military secret. Pfizer wanted to keep their report to the FDA about their clinical trial. They wanted it secret for 75 years. Well, thank goodness that we still have some judges who stop them, say, no, we have to, you have to divulge. This is very important too, you know, it's, I don't know how, how most of the Italian judiciary is about this, uh, but the judiciary needs to be involved. They need to be shamed if they don't want, you don't want to hear cases that uh, would bring out some of the truths. Look, the truth shall set you free. And that's what Albert Camus, French philosopher said, the only way out of a plague is with honesty. And honesty is totally absent today in government and corporate industry. Beh, eh, um, Vera, io Vera, credo che um, le tue parole sono molto forti, molto giuste, really strong and powerful and, and we feel rightly so with you uh, the judiciary system and the transparency of the judiciary system um, are here supposedly to allow us to understand a lot of the things that are kept hidden or that could been kept hidden and we we are we also are um, with you on suspending our, our opinion at the moment for uh, for the Ukraine, the situation in, in Ukraine, because we can really trust the information that we're getting at the moment. So it's, a, it's, it's probably going to be a, a, a matter of time um, until all the, the notions that are against the truth are uncovered. Uh, we really want to thank you for uh, for having been with us and we hope to have you um, again soon for another uh, another wonderful conversation thank you for your activity for your activity of going against um, the mal mal bio biomedical practice and to fighting for consensus and uh, thank you for for having transformed um, your your terrible experiences um, as a as a child in something that can help and can be of a positive um, of, of a positive inspiration for for the people. Uh, thank you very much, and we we hope to see you soon. I hope sometimes in person. I'd like to visit Italy again. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, and Rome awaits for you, of course. So when you come here, you're going to be our guest for sure, and you'll be here in person in our studio, and, and we can chat and, and have a wonderful in-person conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're really an inspirational woman. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I hope so.